Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining in for today's talk. And our prayer is today that this talk will encourage you and that God will speak to you through it. And I do want to say, you got to subscribe to this YouTube channel right now if you want to see more stuff like this, all the latest content coming out. And also, don't forget, check out our website, myhopecity.cc, and connect with us on Facebook by liking our page, Hope City Efton, and joining our Facebook groups. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and I can't wait to see how God is going to speak to you through this talk. Today we're going to wrap up our series, My Mind Cave, and I've just really enjoyed just allowing God to, to move over the last few weeks. Uh, and I know that some people have been helped. Uh, first and foremost, I believe some people have just experienced Jesus showing up in the middle of the cave in their minds. And, and I need you to know and understand today that, that we believe ultimately that, you know, you can do all sorts of things, but, but really it's all about Jesus. Like, you just need Jesus to step into your situation. And I believe when he steps in, all of a sudden, as you begin to follow him, he, he can make a way through all sorts of stuff. But we also got into some practical teaching of, of just ways that we can come out of a cave in our minds. And one thing I think probably some of us were able to, to sort of, realize that we hadn't recognized or realized before is that there are a whole lot of people in, in the Bible that we read about that went through moments and times of, of what we could even say depression and, and mind caves and just, you know, stuff happening in their lives that we weren't the first ones, we aren't the first ones to walk this walk and go through some stuff. I, I want us to start today by just reading some writings of David. And David would write in Psalm chapter 13, it, it would say this, verse 1 to 3 at first. He says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. David, we, we all know about David. The Bible would say David, a, a man after God's own heart. Well, David was a guy that knew what it was to wrestle in his mind, to wrestle in his thoughts. David would have moments in his life where he would literally be in a cave. But much like we talked last week, David knew how to, how to kind of start to, to get out of that cave in his mind. And in verse 5, he would say this, but, everyone say but. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Today, I, I want to just wrap up this series, and I, I really today just want to encourage you. We, we've gone through some practical stuff, but today I just want you to leave encouraged. Is that all right? Look at someone close to you or you're in a room with someone and just say, like, like we're going to be encouraged today. Well, we're going to be encouraged today. And I, I want you to be encouraged, if you don't hear anything else, but be encouraged with this thought, that when you feel surrounded. Because for a lot of us, the cave in our minds, that's what it feels like, isn't it? We're, we're surrounded by worry, we're surrounded by anxiety, we're surrounded by fear, we're, we're sur surrounded by deadlines, we're surrounded by pressures, we're surrounded by family, surrounded by kids. It's just, it's just like everything seems to be pressuring in and I want us today to leave with this thought that when you feel surrounded, know you are surrounded. When you feel surrounded, know you are surrounded. We read an amazing story, and it's recorded in 2 Kings. And just to give you a little backdrop of, 
of what's going on. Elisha is now the man of God, the prophet of God, that, that he would succeed the Elijah. And so he, he now is the man. And, and as we read the, the story of what's happening in, in the history is that king of Aram was out to get the Israelites. He's out to take them out, and so the Armenian army, they, they would set up plans and set up camps and know well, the Israelites are probably going to come this way, and when they come, we can wipe them out. When, when they show up, we, we'll to plunder, we'll take their stuff, we'll kill a bunch of them, and, and, and this was their plan. And, but Elisha, he knew God. He was a man of God. He walked with God, and God would reveal to him what the enemy was up to. And so over and over again, the The enemy would get ready. They'd be said, we know the Israelites are going to come this way. Elisha would hear from God, and and, and then he would go to the king of Israel, and he'd say, hey, king, just so you know, like, like I, I've been in the presence of God, and, and he's let me know, like, the enemy is going to be here, so we don't want to go that way, and they would go another way. And so the king of Aram, he gets furious. He gets so upset, and, and so he calls his, his leaders in, and, and, and everyone, he's like, okay, what's going on? Like, wh- who's the traitor? Someone's got to be a traitor. How does the Israelites always know where we're going to be and when we're going to be there? So they look at the king of Aram and they're like, it's it's not us, king. You've got to know, you've got to understand something. That there is a prophet with the Israelites. Elisha, and God reveals to him everything. He he knows everything. Like, king, you need to understand that, that... he probably knows stuff you're saying when you're in your bedroom. Like, that, that's how much detail God seems to be giving him. And, and, and so this is where we'll pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 6. Go find out where he is, Elisha, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. Someone say surrounded. When the servant of the man of God, so Elisha's servant, he he got up and went out early the next morning. An army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what what shall we do? The the servant asked. He goes to Elisha like, what what are we going to do? Where we're surrounded, the enemy, they, they, they're all, all around us. And then this is what Elisha would say. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Okay, can we, can we read that line together? Like some of you, you just need that, that verse to, to sink into your spirit today. Can we read that together? Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now a little inside information. He, he, he wasn't saying like, hey, the Israel army is really great. Like you don't have to worry. Because if that was the case, they wouldn't have been trying to avoid them all the time, Right? That, that wasn't what he was saying. He, he was saying, no, you need to understand, right now it, it looks like and feels like we are surrounded, but more with us than are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes. Open the servant's eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And my prayer for you today before you leave this building is God, open our eyes. God, let us see that when it feels and it looks like we are surrounded and pressures are coming in and we find ourselves in a cave in our mind, let us see beyond the circumstance and beyond the situation and let us see that we are surrounded, truly surrounded. If you read the rest of the story, just because I don't want to leave you there, it's really cool because uh, now, we understand the Old Testament didn't always go this way, and we see the, the wrath of God a lot in the Old Testament, but, but what will happen is actually God will blind the, the army, the Armenian army. And so they're blinded. I don't believe it was a physical blindness myself. Maybe it was, uh, but at least blinded to the situation, definitely blinded to who Elisha was. And so Elisha goes right out in the middle of them. 
And he's just like, hey, guys, what are you all doing here? And they're like, we're looking for the prophet Elisha. And he's like, oh, well, hey, he's not here. You're in the wrong spot. And so he leads them out. He leads them. The guy they're after leads them out and leads them right into the middle of the Israelite army, right in the middle of their camp. Like, sitting ducks. We got them now. And so the king of Israel goes to the prophet, and he's like, well, what are we going to do? And should we kill them all? And, and the prophet says, no, here's, here's a plan. Give them some food. Give them a big feast and send them on their way. And so that's what he would do, and he would feed them and send them on their way, and they go back. And after that, the king of Aram decided, hey, maybe we don't want to go after those guys anymore. When you feel surrounded, know you are surrounded. The first thing that you need to know you are surrounded by is you are surrounded by angels. You are surrounded by angels. There is, a, there is a teaching, there is a conversation throughout Scripture, and that is angels. It, it amazes me because a lot of us today, we, we don't really talk about it. We, we you know, I, I don't know, and, and so it's not a conversation that we'll often have. But if you read the Bible, you see, like, angels are, are everywhere, that, that they're created being, and, and all the time, in the beginning, and all the way right through, and all eternity, we will see the activity of angels. And especially, I mean, when Jesus showed up, the New Testament, it was just like angels everywhere, like, giving words, and, and heavenly hosts, in the skies and all sorts of things and so this whole idea of angels is throughout scripture it's amazing and maybe this is a trick of the enemy I, I was thinking about this but it's amazing that that very often very often people want to believe in heaven but they don't want to believe in hell right we, we, we see that in our culture today. Like, absolutely, we like the idea of a heaven, but, but not so much the idea of, of a hell. And, but, but then it's almost like there's this flip that, that when it comes to the spirit world, it's like we all recognize there's evil and, 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 and there must be some, you know, demonic activity and stuff going on. And, and it's almost like we put more emphasis on that and the enemy fills us with fear and we fail to recognize, wait a minute, there are spiritual forces at work and a whole lot of them are angels. The Bible actually tells us that, that when Satan was cast out of heaven, Lucifer, the third of the angels, went with him. So right there we know, hey, the heavenly angels outnumber them. But, but then we also realize God's the one that creates the angels. So guess what? Nowhere does the Bible say, well, God decided to stop creating angels. Like, like angels are everywhere. Different places in the Bible, Psalms 34, 7 says this, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Psalm 91.11 says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. We jump to the New Testament, and in Hebrews he would say this, he says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Jesus one day was teaching and I believe the context, he wasn't talking just specifically about children, but he was telling his followers that, that unless you become like a child, unless you have childlike faith, that, that you can't inherit or enter the, the kingdom of heaven. And he's letting them know about this. And then he would say these words. He says, beware, Matthew 18, verse 10, beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. Not necessarily children. Sometimes we read that and think, oh, he's just talking about children. But no, I believe he was talking about children of God. Like, like don't look down on, on the children of God, those who have childlike faith. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels, someone say angels, are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. So those that, that have talked about angels, sort of like we think, well, maybe we have a guardian angel. Maybe, well, according to Jesus, it's not like just one angel. It's like you got a whole bunch of angels. Like, like, and I don't even believe necessarily Jesus was saying, like, like, look out for them. Like, they got all these angels. But, but he was probably just saying, like, this is how important every one of my children are. This is how important they are is, is that their angels are in the very presence of God. And I need someone to know and I need you to recognize today that whenever you feel surrounded, know that you are surrounded by angels. The second thing is this, is not only are we surrounded today by 
by angels, but we are surrounded by the presence of the triune God. We're surrounded by the presence of a triune God. And we, we've been reading throughout this series about Elijah. And when Elijah would, would really be at the darkest moment of his life on earth and wanted his life to end, and he ends up in a literal cave. And, and so I want today to, to just read when he finally comes out of the cave, okay? I, I figured it'd be a good idea, not just leave him in the cave. Like, let's, let's finish it at the end of the series and see when he gets out. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, we'll pick it up in, in verse 9. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. And I, I'm the only one left, and now they are going, they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of of the Lord. Someone say that in the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in, a, in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. I need you to know today that when you feel surrounded, know that you are surrounded by the presence of a triune God. Bible teaches us that God is everywhere. God is everywhere. There is no place you can go. There is no place or anything that you can do that could ever separate you from God. Absolutely nothing. I, I need someone to know today that when you are, are at the most joyful, happiest moments of your life and it, it's all like sunshine and, and beautiful skies, I need you to know God is right there. And when you find yourself in the darkest moment of life and it feels like you're in a cave in your mind and you can't get out, I need you to know today that God is there. He's right there. Right there beside you. And, and then we all see this whole idea. And maybe this is why in the New Testament there's not a whole lot of teaching about angels. Is, is because we understand that through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus himself can come right to our situation. We, we know that, that Jesus himself through the power of the Holy Spirit is right there. First John says this in chapter 4 verse 13. And God has given us the spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. The Hebrews 13 says this. For God said I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. Or I'll never leave you or I will never forsake you. Jesus said these words. He's looking at his disciples. He, he's telling them to follow his commands. In Matthew 28, 20 he says and be sure of this. I am with you always. Someone say always. When is always? Always. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I was preparing and just praying, getting ready for this weekend. And, and, and I don't know what it is. Sometimes, sometimes when you've grown up in, in church or around the presence of God, that that you sometimes will just kind of go to some old songs. And, and I think a part of that is just we have some memories and, and, and yes, some emotions end up coming. But, but I was just in the presence of God and I found myself just singing or humming like some old songs that, that I remember singing as a kid and, and growing up. And that there was one that I, I honestly didn't even remember all of the lyrics. I, I didn't remember, but there was a line in a song and I at least could get the first little bit, but... Some of you might remember, we used to sing a song, he's as close as the mention of his name. Jesus, Jesus. And we used to sing lines like that. And I need you to know today that that is as close as Jesus is. To the moment you speak his name. 
I, I remember, and the thought just came back to me, I remember Paige and I, I we, we just got married, I, I actually had one of my father-in-law's uh, work trucks, we were going on vacation, we drove to Bangor, and we, we were coming back, and we hit a bunch of black ice on the, on the highway before, before Holton, and I just had the two-wheel drive on, and, and I remember going, and, and all of a sudden just, just completely lost control, going however fast on the highway. It was a beautiful day. I didn't realize uh, that, that it had gotten wet and just the temperature dropped. That was back before we had temperature <laughs> gauges in our car warning us roads may be slippery. And I remember we, we hit that black ice just in a moment, and, and the truck started going to the left and then to the right, and we went up over the snowbank, and just in that moment, couldn't say anything, couldn't do anything, but I just said, Jesus, Jesus, in that moment. And we went over the snowbank, and anyone that's ever traveled that highway, it's, it's forest everywhere, and, and, and all of a sudden, we, we just landed right in the middle of trees, <laughs> like middle of the snow, right side up, the car pulled over that was following us, he came running over the snowbank, and he couldn't believe what he saw. Because we were sitting there like we parked there perfectly. Like someone just picked us up and placed us in the middle of, of the snow. And he was like, you, you guys didn't roll? You didn't? They're like, no. And we had to call the tow truck and get a tow us out and drove the rest of the way home. And I'm just telling you, if that was angels all around us that day. Or, or in that moment, I just spoke the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, I'm right here. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm as close as the mention of my name. We used to sing a song, some of you might remember this, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel a brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings, I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. When you feel surrounded, know you are surrounded. You're surrounded by angels. You are surrounded by the presence of a triune God. And the last one I want to leave you with, and we talked a little bit about this a couple weeks ago. Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, therefore, someone say therefore. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. We all have a race to run, right? My race is not your race, and your race is not my race. But God has given us all a race. In verse 2, he says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer lets us know and reminds us, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. That we are, if we could see it and just realize it and understand, like, like there are people cheering us on. There are people saying, you can do it. You can get through this situation. You want to know who they are? You look back a chapter in chapter 11, and it's known sort of as the heroes of faith or the, the faith hall of fame. And, and you could just start going through the, the list of all these people. And you know what can happen, though, is as we read in chapter 11, we know the end story. 
We know the, the end of, of all of these people's lives. Like we, we know, like, wow, they, they were a man of faith. Wow, she was a, a woman of faith. Like, whoa, God used them. We know the end story. And, and I got a feeling that the reason they're in the list isn't just because of the end of their story, but it is because of the journey they walked. And many of them, many of them had moments of darkness Moments they wrestled with their thoughts. Moments that they would feel like they were in, in caves in their mind. M moments where, where they would mess up. Moments where they would fail. And that's who would be listed. I mean, you look at the list and probably every one of them, every one of them, if you started to read and study their entire story, you would realize, wait a minute. They're not much different than me. No, Noah, we, we all remember the story of Noah, like, like there's a man of faith. God, God speaks to him in, in a land where they haven't seen rain for years. And he's like, I'm going to not just let some rain come. I'm going to flood the whole earth. And, and so you got to build this boat. And so Noah, by faith, he starts building. Starts building, telling everyone, hey, rain's coming. The earth's going to flood. And everyone, everyone made fun of him. They laughed at him, said, you're crazy. You are out of your mind, Noah. But he knew he heard from God. And I, I just got to keep, keep on going. And eventually we know the story. And only Noah and his family would end up in the ark and the animals. The floods come and, and the earth's flooded and then finally after we, we get to, to the other side and you would think, okay, God, just so you guys know, this is why I believe the Bible so much. Because if I was just making up a story, I would end it there. Like, like okay, the flood's over, all good, they made it now, got dry land again, going to start the family again, let's go. But no, we get the whole story and Noah end up building a field they're growing all these grapes and they set up a wine press and Noah this great man of faith whatever was going on in his mind and his thoughts he decides I'm going to get drunk falls off the wagon makes a fool of himself but then he's listed in the New Testament in the list of heroes of faith Abraham was another person listed and Abraham, I mean, we, we look, I mean, yeah, like, obviously, God, God raised him up, the, the father of many nations, and father Abraham, and many sons, many sons, and I'm one of them, you remember that song, we're going to go old school, let's go that one, like, you all remember that crazy song, like, I, like Abraham, we, we all know, like, wow, this great man of faith, like, you think of the years from the time he got the promise, till he actually had his son Isaac, it got so bad, it, like, I, I prayed earlier, and I pray now, God, don't let us just see these stories as a couple of chapters we read in the Bible, but let us recognize, let us recognize the length of time that these people live that we read about in Hebrews 11. And Abraham got tired of waiting. He decided, I'm going to speed things up, like, let's, let's work this out, and his wife's like, hey, go sleep with that girl, and okay, since my wife told me to, like... Stepping out of the plan of God because he didn't understand why isn't God showing up the way I thought he would show up or when he th I thought he would show up. And you can go through the list and probably every one of them, every one of them. I mean, Joseph, Joseph, he has his dream from God. Like, God, yeah, yeah, this is amazing. I can't wait to go tell my brothers. Joseph has this dream from God that, that one day that, that everyone's going to bow down before him and, and even his own family. And so he goes and tells his brothers, like, oh, guys, guess this great dream I had. Like, that your little brother, like, like I have to tell my 11-year-old my to make him understand, like, your little brothers are annoying, period. Like, that's just part of having a little brother. You're going to find them annoying. So Joseph goes to his older brothers, like, I had this dream. God gave me this dream, and then he gave me another dream. Like, this is it. God, I believe, had to teach Joseph some stuff. Obviously, he had to teach him about pride and had to bring him down a little bit. But Joseph, after having the dream, he ends up in a pit, thrown in a pit by his own family, his own brothers, sold into slavery, would end up in prison, years removed from the dream he had. You can't tell me that Joseph didn't at least have a couple moments where he just said, God, 
did I really hear from you? God, did you really speak to me? God, was that dream really from you? Even in prison, he, he, he interprets a couple of guys' dreams and helps them out. And, and he says, like, guys, just when you get out of here, remember me. And the moment they're out, they forget all about them. The writer would say, remember, you're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. People, yeah, they're men and women of faith, but it wasn't all perfect. And it wasn't all moments where, where everything was beautiful and the sun was shining. There were a lot of dark times and there were a lot of dark, dark caves. David, a man after God's own heart who we read at the beginning of this lesson, would say, how long? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day, I have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? David's saying, I, I know what it is. To be in the cave. I, I know what it is to, to wrestle with your thoughts. I, I, I know what it is to, to wonder what is happening and what is going on. But, but I, oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, let us see today a heavenly host of angels surrounding us. Let us realize we're surrounded by your presence. And God, let us see a crowd of witnesses that are cheering you on and saying you can do it. You can get out of this cave. You don't have to listen to the lies of the enemy of your soul. You would list, say, a number of prophets, and you could be sure Elijah most likely would be one of the prophets that their minds would definitely go to when they would have read the letter in Hebrews. The New Testament does tell us that Elijah was a man just like you and I. He was a human just like you and I. And probably the place it's most evident is the story that we've been reading throughout this series. That he got to a place that he said, God, I don't even want to live. The writer in Hebrews he would continue on in chapter 12. And in chapter 12, verse 18, he would write this. He says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire. To darkness, gloom, and storm. You, you, you haven't come from, from here to the, this place of of darkness, gloom, and, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no farther word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. The writer starts to paint a picture that they would very much understand he starts to paint a picture of the old covenant. The mountain when the, the law was given to Moses. And, and it was so holy that, that no one could, could even touch the mountain. That, that, that it was full of fear and doom and gloom. And so the writer is painting this picture and saying, all these guys, men and women of faith and by faith and by faith. And remember that you're surrounded by, by such a crowd of witnesses so so throw off everything and run your race and understand because God's not taking you to this place of doom and gloom in verse 22 he says this but you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. 
God. God, let us see today. God, let us see with spiritual eyes that when it looks like we're surrounded and it feels we are surrounded, Lord, may we see we are surrounded by a host of angels, your very presence, and a cloud of witnesses. I hope today's talk was encouraging to you, and hey, we would love to hear from you of how God spoke to you through this talk, and again, you can message us on Facebook. Make sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hope City F10. You can reach out on our website, myhopecity.cc. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all the content coming out. And we are excited to see how God is going to continually move through your life through this. Love you guys. Have a great day.